Hey guys, and welcome back. Um, so, seems like I'm still here in Sydney, Australia, hence the infrequent posting, but let's go ahead and get into another video. So I've been kind of debating you all for a while now, saying that I was going to cover all of the distributed systems topics in this new series, and I haven't really been doing so. Um, and that's for good reason, in my opinion. I think that it's really important that we kind of slow down and take the time to understand everything that has been happening on a single database node before we make it even more complicated by talking about a bunch of database nodes. So hopefully, you know, by actually slowing down, really diving into the weeds a little bit, we can get these concepts down a little bit better, and then I won't have to answer so many goddamn questions in the comments and waste my own time. So without further ado, let's talk about an introduction to database replication. This is pretty much the most important possible topic in distributed systems. So yeah, let's get into it. Okay, so I'm back again with the trusty iPad. So let's start talking about replication and kind of what that means. So for you beginners, let's go ahead and start this out with a very simple scenario. I am the owner of a website and this is kind of what my data setup looks like, right? I've got it all drawn out. So we've got one server over here, we've got one database, and then we've got, let's say, five different users. So these three are going to be from the US, and then we've got Australians over here. As you can see, other side of the planet, the Earth is in fact flat, so keep that in mind. Um, so like I said, we've got one database, right? One server, very simple, five users. What if one day I'm going ahead and walking in my apartment with my one database and I trip and spill my coffee on this database? Well, a few things are going to be problematic. For starters, one, what happens to all of the data that I had on this machine? Well, if I'm able to restart it and it just powered down for some reason, okay, fine, I don't lose my data. But I do still have some downtime, right? Now all of my users aren't going to be able to use my server, and as a result, my application is going to stop making money. But what if the data does get corrupted? Hard drives break pretty frequently. You know, besides spilling coffee, I might just come around and eat one. And as a result, you know, it's pretty easy to lose your data. So literally just having one single disk where that's all stored is a pretty poor idea. And then even besides all of that, there's some performance concerns as well. Like I mentioned, I have these two idiots over here. For whatever reason, they're living in Australia. I don't know why anyone would do that. And as a result, they're super far away from my database, which will be conveniently located in the United States. So all of their requests are taking forever. Even more so, another problem is there might just be a ton of users. And if there's so many users, just having one database to handle all of those user requests, user reads, and user writes probably isn't sufficient. So let's go ahead and move on. And we'll talk about now what life is when we do replication. So before we can even talk about what life with replication actually is, we have to talk about what replication means. Basically, for now, let's assume it's just going to mean many databases. And what many databases means is many copies of that data that we care about on our database. So yeah, you can replicate other things, and we certainly will later in this series, but for now, we're only going to talk about replication as it pertains to databases. So again, we've got our server over here. We've got our database as like our cylinder looking things. And then over here, you know, we've got our Americans, we've got our uh, Asians, so we'll call this uh, basically, um, you know what, no, this will be Europe, and this will be Australia or APAC. And so as you can see, now all of us have different servers and different databases. And so the nice part about that is a few things. One, we have redundant data, which means no lost data. If every single one of these databases has its own copy of all of the data from our website, it means that if one of them were to go get taken out, we could all route our requests to the other databases, which is really nice. Another thing now is that we have increased database throughput. The reason for this is that all of my American users get to use one database, all of my Australian users get to use another, and then all of our European users get to use another. So effectively, we've increased our database throughput by three times just by allowing everyone to use their own copy of the data. Obviously, this is going to come with some caveats, but we'll discuss those later. And then, of course, now we can allow Australians to have uh, basically a database that's closer to them. So not only is there increased database throughput by virtue of having more databases, but also we can geolocate our data centers uh, closer to certain users so that they can get better performance. So again, screw Australians, but fair enough, we'll give them a database. So that's really nice. So before we even you know, go into basically certain types of replication that you can do with your database, I just want to you know, quickly put uh, an informative warning in this video. I'm not going to get too deep into the weeds here. This is an introduction. The next three videos are going to get quite a bit deeper, but we are going to go through some of the basics of how you actually replicate data from one database node to the other. 
So first we're going to talk about synchronous replication versus asynchronous replication. So synchronous replication is basically the following. We've got our one guy over here, this is our client, and we've got a couple of databases. So let's say the client writes the first database saying x is equal to 4, just some key value start. And then the first database says, okay, I agree, x is equal to 4. You're good to go. Then what's going to happen now is the first database has to go ahead and forward this request to the second database because the second database needs a full copy of the data. So it's going to go ahead and do that and then the second database says okay x is in fact equal to 4. Now what's going to happen is basically once the, the client receives word from both databases that x is equal to 4, we know that this write is considered valid and basically other clients who did not in fact do the x equals 4 write can start reading the new value of x. This is known as strong consistency, basically meaning that um, you know the second I do a write, I'm not going to consider it valid until every single replica has a copy of that data. In contrast, we also have asynchronous replication, where the first thing I would do when I'm making a write is go ahead and perform the write, hear back from my database, but then from there on, the database can actually consider that write valid. In the background, the first database is going to asynchronously replicate x equals 4 to the second database, but in the meantime, it's still possible for another client to go ahead and read x equals 3, if uh, 3 was the old value. So what this is known as is eventual consistency. The main point being here that in strong consistency, it's not possible to read stale data, where stale data is, I guess, data that would be considered old, right? We know that x equals 4 is the proper value, but in an eventually consistent model, the thing that's going to happen is it's still possible for other clients to read older pieces of data because we didn't require the second replica to have to be completely updated the second the write came in. So this comes at a cost, obviously, with strong consistency, which is that, well, writes are going to take forever, right? Because now we have to write to two databases instead of one. And in my example from before, that means every single American is going to have to write to the database that's in Europe, it's going to have to write to the database that's in APAC, and these writes are going to take a while to propagate. So in reality, we don't really see strong consistency used too much. There are cases where we do have to use it because stale reads are unacceptable, but in a lot of common modern web applications, Basically, eventual consistency is the norm, and we'll talk about ways to kind of be clever with it to try and avoid getting a lot of stale reads. Okay, so that is basically one kind of concern, which is, you know, kind of when do we actually do our replication? Do we do it immediately? Do we do it in the background? But more importantly, another important part of replication is actually how we replicate, right? So we know that we're going to have one database which is going to receive a write and it's going to pass all of that information to other databases which need to make a full copy of it. So there are basically three ways that you can do this and we're going to talk about the trade-offs of performing every single one of them. So the first thing is a pretty easy option. We just take all of the SQL statements or if it's a NoSQL database, whatever other statements are kind of going into the database and copying them directly to our replica database. So for example, if we have the command insert row Jordan you know, we could just copy that over. However, there are some pretty obvious issues with just copying SQL statements, which is that some of them are non-deterministic. So for example, if we were to use the command time.now, it means that, you know, the original write result of time.now is going to be different than the result of the replica time.now, and we don't want write conflicts. That is very unacceptable. They're hard to resolve, and it's going to cause a lot of pesky issues down the road when you're trying to read data. That's unacceptable. So for this reason, just exporting SQL statements tends to be unacceptable. Another possible option is using the write-ahead log. So we've spoken about the write-ahead log plenty in the past, and basically all it is is saying at exact byte values what you're going to be writing at a certain point of time. It's just a sequential log on disk. So for example, you know, at memory address, or rather at disk address 0x0aff, write the word Jordan. So this could work, and in fact it's a pretty good implementation, however it does have some fundamental issues, which is that not all of our replicas are going to be running the same database software. For example, I might be running one instance of MySQL, and I want to be replicating that to a Postgres SQL instance. Maybe because in Postgres there are certain reads that are a little bit more optimized, and we want a copy of the data formatted that way so that we can read from it. Postgres is going to look at 0x0aff and say, what the hell am I doing with this? I don't use this memory address, so why do I need that? So for this reason, write-ahead logs can be pretty useless when it comes to replication. Which ultimately leads us to our last and final solution, which is what's often done in practice, called a replication log. 
So a replication log or a logical log basically just says at what ID to perform the write because every single one of these SQL databases is going to have the concept of basically an ID in a row. So as long as you say, you know, at ID one, put Jordan with an attractiveness of 10 and at ID six, put the name of tech lead with an attractiveness of six, every single SQL database is gonna understand that. And so it's obviously going to be very easy to then go ahead and send those changes over the network from a MySQL database to a Postgres database. Obviously, it does come at the cost of having to create this logical log because we already have a write-ahead log, but we don't have our replication log. We are going to have to make one, and in theory, that should add a little bit of extra overhead on each write. But hopefully, for the most part, this introduction to replication does make sense. The general gist of it is literally creating extra copies of your database data. It allows for more throughput for all of your users. It allows for durability in the event of a crash or an idiot like myself spilling coffee on the database. And of course, it allows for the possibility of placing certain databases in regions such that they can serve certain users even better. So overall, for any big application, any Google or Facebook or anything like that, replication is a complete must have. There's no way in hell that you would possibly have a huge company that relies on data without completely replicating that data many, many times over. So with that being said, guys, I hope you enjoyed the introduction. I will speak to you guys in the next one, and we'll dive into this quite a bit deeper because there's a lot to unpack here.